they forget there's another 8,000 tools out there, mm -hmm. right? And the other companies are the ones that are literally adopting as fast as possible. Yeah. I feel like this is like electricity. I believe it's not fair that everyone doesn't have equal access to it. So I think what's happening is that data and the, the access to data is trickling down. I think we're going to see a huge, huge growth. When you made that statement about the rate of change inside the business, yeah. I had goosebumps because it was so apt. I've never heard it before. Mm. <laughs> Hey, it's Ronsley. Welcome, you AI geek, to Amplify AI. Consider this podcast your digital compass for you, the business leader, wanting to use artificial intelligence ethically and in alignment with your brand's identity to achieve your business goals. Leading and running a business in the world of AI is like solving a Rubik's Cube blindfolded. But this podcast and I are here to make that easy. Every episode is a masterclass in unlocking techniques for using AI as a business leader, founder, owner. Thanks for being here. Let's learn. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Ron Slate. This is Amplify AI, and this is episode number 74. And this is part two of three part series, the last episode, and we spoke about how to organize and think for success. We're talking about redefining modern leadership in the age of AI with Cameron Harold. That was part one. Today, we're talking about part two, and Cameron Harold is a legend in the space. If this is the first time you're sort of tuning in and you missed part one, then and you missed my introduction. He's written multiple books, and he is kind of got this great podcast called The Second in Command. It's for all the second in command people, the operational people, the people that get it done. And he's got a group called the COO Alliance. So check him out, Google him. He's got lots of books. But today we're talking about transforming entrepreneurial mindsets using artificial intelligence. How to use AI for problem solving, for creation, for solving meaningful business problems, meaningful entrepreneurship, what does it look like? And how in this current landscape should business leaders adopt AI? We're talking about some really cool stuff, including marketing and messaging. So enjoy this episode and come, let's learn. What are you seeing right now out there? When you look at your clients that are very successful CEOs and COOs and yeah. businesses, what is right now happening in the market? I'm seeing two things. Yeah. One is the cohort, the companies who have said, oh, AI is just chat GPT. We played with it. We tried it. Yeah, our marketing team's using it. We've moved on. They forget there's another 8,000 tools out there, mm -hmm. right? And the other companies are the ones that are literally adopting as fast as possible. Yeah. They're letting their employees play with it. Very similar to how Google has like one day a week where they allow employees just right. to do their skunk works and play with stuff. I think the good companies are letting their employees play with all these different AI tools, report back on the AI tools. They're bringing an AI speaker in every month over Zoom. They're literally immersed in playing with it and learning it. They're watching YouTube videos on it and sharing it with their teams. They recognize that this rate of change is massively different. Yeah. And I've seen that split happen over the last six months. Right. 12 months ago, all companies were thinking about AI. Now it's only about 30% that are thinking about it and 70% have said, oh, it's just for marketing. Mm -hmm. I did see that even at the start that most people were thinking artificial intelligence, Let's. I don't need it for content. I'm a really good copywriter. Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, what are you not good at? Why don't you give AI to do that? Mm -hmm. Because again, as founders, as entrepreneurs, we are like, I like an entrepreneurship to, I believe, mothers of the original entrepreneurs. They've got to be, you know, the hug giver, the chef, the homework person, everything. The planner. Yep. Yeah. They do it all for this child to be of value to the planet. And entrepreneurs are no different, right? We are the graphics designer, the salesperson, the delivery person for this business to be of value to the planet. Yeah. And I feel like this is like electricity. I believe it's not fair that everyone doesn't have equal access to it if it ever gets to that point. What are your thoughts on how this is gonna impact creation, how it's gonna impact solving meaningful problems, especially, because you know most of us, I hope, as entrepreneurs get into business to solve meaningful problems. I, I think we're starting to see now, it's Moore's law, right? That the amount of capacity doubles and the cost actually cuts in half every single year. So internet access, right? Starlink. Right, the ability to have Wi-Fi access in African villages or in the small Indian towns or in northern, Af you know, northern Africa, wherever, or in small remote towns in Canada or the United States. 
it, it's giving access to the internet to and on mobile and on smaller tech devices and on outdated devices that can still surf the web. I think there's a, an amount of technology that's now trickling down. Mm -hmm. Like mobile pay in Africa is way bigger than mobile pay is in Canada and the United States. Really? Massively different. Everyone pays with their cell phone in, in Africa. Everybody does. Mm. There's so many different mobile pay apps. There, 20 years ago, when you drove through villages in Africa, you saw Coca-Cola signs everywhere. Yeah. Right. Now what you see is all the signs for the mobile pay apps. They're everywhere. That hasn't taken hold yet in North America. We're still using our credit cards. We're still using cash. So I think what's happening is that data and the, the access to data is trickling down. I think we're going to see a huge, huge growth. It's why we're seeing the growth of the middle class in India, the growth of the middle class in Africa right now, is they do have way more access to that than they had 30 years ago. Andy Grove from Intel said only the paranoid survive. It's a little bit of that, the, the ones who are a little bit paranoid of what's happening with AI that are going to embrace it, mm -hmm. or the ones that realize that rate of change outside the business is happening very quickly, I need to embrace it. Yeah. They're going to do well, and I think it is trickling down. Yeah. And by the way, when you made that statement about the rate of change inside the business, also, yeah. I had goosebumps because it was so apt. I've never heard it before. Mm, I've been and saying it for 20 years. It is so on point yeah. as it, well. The, the reality is that I saw another t-shirt years ago, and it was a Nike t-shirt. It said, somewhere right now, someone is practicing. Mm. And when they meet you in head-to-head -head competition, they'll beat you. Mm -hmm. And I've always subscribed to a little bit of that. And I think that's why the good leaders and the good companies are embracing everything about AI. They're playing with it. They're learning about it. They're asking about it. They know that it's more than just retyping a marketing message, right? Yeah. It's like 20 years ago, it was like cool to have a website for your company. Every company has a website now. The small, tiny little mechanic shop in Northern Idaho has a website, right. but that wasn't so 20 years ago. Correct. I think leveraging AI is going to be exactly the same thing in five years. Yeah. Yeah. You've seen different cultures, you've seen different things in, from a, a lens of freedom and a lens of creation and mm -hmm. a lens of, of an entrepreneur. I would love to know what stands out. What have you seen that is that right now you go, oh yeah, that, that was pretty cool. That was something interesting. What have you seen? I've seen a, th a few things. So the three that come very quickly top of mind are, I feel like there's four hubs in the world that are these entrepreneurial hotbeds. We're sitting in one of them, Dubai, mm -hmm. right? Everyone in Dubai is op opportunistic, they're, they're optimistic, they're entrepreneurial, they're cool and they're building something, right? Portugal is another yep. one. Bali in Indonesia is a third and Austin, Texas is a fourth. Mm -hmm. There's lots of cities that are technology, but those four tend to be this like vortex of entrepreneurial. So there's something about when you, you know, the saying of you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. If you plug yourself into one of those four vortexes, your cycle is like this. No one in these, in these areas is sitting talking about social media or the sports team and how they played. All they're doing is talking about what they're working on. And yeah. it could be social issues. It could be causes. It could be entrepreneurship. It could be crypto. It could be whatever. Yeah. But everyone's building something. So I feel that. The second thing that I started to feel was the digital currency happening whether it's with crypto or whether it's digital pay, but now like the tapping of a phone, that's still not a big thing in North America. But people in Denmark, as an example, when you pull out cash to pay at a coffee shop, no, no, we don't take cash. <laughs> like they don't even take it. Yeah. Like, I started feeling that with my kids about two years ago, they don't want physical paper or coins. Yeah. That's a strange thing that I hadn't seen. So mobile money and the convergence, I think is starting to happen there. And then the third one, this is a little bit weird because I'm not a fan. People in like 20 or 30 countries think Trump was amazing. Like they actually really like him or respected him as a leader. I don't like him as a human being. I wish he was a nicer person to people. And we could easily take that as an example to see that, okay, that's the way we've got to be as leaders to, to prosper. I don't know. Like, but if you see Brexit, you see yeah. like Australia just had a vote half a donkey's years about allowing indigenous, uh, allowing an indigenous voice in parliament, right? Just like a, it was just a, a referendum. It was a vote that all Australians had to, you know, go to the polls yeah. to make. And it was uh, a box of yes and no. And over 65% of the population said no. Yeah, it blows my mind. But the people around me were like, that sounds crazy. Similar to Brexit, yeah. a lot of people that I knew were like, ah, oh, this is never going to happen. 
Same with Trump. Well, have you studied why Brexit happened? No, please. So the Cambridge Analytica, I actually saw the woman who was the CEO of Cambridge Analytica speak at TED and she talked about what actually happened. So they were a marketing agency that understood the analytics of data. They understood there were nine different personality profiles in the UK. And then they found mm -hmm. that in this one section of UK, Wales, if they took those nine segments, the three middle groups, the level four, five, and six, were the influenceables. They could be switched to the right or they could be switched to the left. So what they did was they started buying ads and driving traffic and driving stories to that group of people. And that 50,000 person swapped over and actually swung the vote. So wow. it was the manipulation of humans and the manipulation of humans through marketing, which yeah. is how elections are won. Yeah. So yeah, that was really intriguing to me. And it's something that I don't like about Trump is there's a lot of what he'll say isn't true. Right. Like here's, he's being up on so many different indictments and crimes, whether you're on the left or the right, it a little bit of, as, like, as our grandma would say, whether smoke, there's fire. Yes. There's a little bit of something that doesn't quite feel right to me, yes. but somehow people are okay with that. Maybe it's because we all feel like all politicians are crooked. So well, let's go with the one that we see momentum with. I don't know what it is, but what I understand from this is marketing is powerful. Mm. Messaging is powerful. Putting your messaging and your marketing in front of the right group of people that you want to influence is powerful mm. and hyper targeting your message instead of trying to target everybody. Like what I'm targeting is the COO. Yeah. The reason is there's hundreds of groups marketing to the entrepreneur. Mm. I market to their second in command, which means all of those groups that target entrepreneurs can be partners for me or they can be referrals for me. Right. So I'm just hyper selective with the group that I'm targeting. What you're talking about is so important, especially for something, someone like myself, because mm -hmm. I realized, you know, a few years ago that me helping people use their voice was part of my mission. And one of the reasons for that is my ancestors did not have the opportunity to switch on a microphone and say mm. whatever they wanted to say, mm. whenever they wanted to say it. And there's such power in that because data is everything. And if the data that has been captured is not what we want to see, then we might have a responsibility to capture the data that we want to see, like having the conversation that we really care about. That's why podcasting is so powerful. It's powerful. Hey, AI Geek, thanks for listening. Your job doesn't stop here. I want you to lend your voice to the conversation. So you can join those conversations, discussions, new trainings, new recordings, and the rest of the AI Geeks by going to aigeeks.co. Also, share this podcast with a friend, another potential AI Geek. Until then, much love.